Hey guys, two things I want to share with you before we jump into today's episode. First, I'm going to be sharing with you an interview I gave with Mr. Cy Kellett on the three biggest mistakes people make in apologetics. Uh, and I've made these, I've learned them the hard way. Uh, so I think you'll really like it. It's for the Catholic Answers Focus podcast. Be sure to check them out. You can check out, they have a new YouTube channel. So go and subscribe to Catholic Answers Focus podcast. I'll leave a link below. Number two is you might have seen in the background of some of my videos, a little sculpture. It is a lemon with a sword. It's holding an olive behind it. They got little legs they're standing on. And he's fighting a lime. The lime sword fell off. I got to glue it back on. But it's just a little funny thing I put on my bookshelf. I bought it in an art store a long time ago. The lemon fighting the lime. He's holding the olive behind him. The name of the sculpture, Winner Takes Olive. I know, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible pun. But now you know what it is behind the bookshelf when you see it. All right, without further ado, here's my interview with Mr. Cy Kellett on the three big mistakes people make when doing apologetics. Um, when we asked you if you would do a kind of a countdown or a, a numbered uh, episode with us of the biggest errors that one might make in apologetics, I was a little surprised at your answers, but, I'm, I, but very pleasantly surprised. I wouldn't have thought of the way you went, and uh, it looks exciting and interesting to me. I just want to let people know right from the beginning, number two will blow your mind. As with any list, that's something you should always promise. I do also want to make a, a caveat that I personally have never made any of these mistakes, actually. Uh, I think the only mistake I've ever made as an apologist is is being too humble, actually, yeah, and not letting enough people know about what I do. I've noticed that. I've noticed that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I, I'm <laughs> glad to hear you say that, because I, I think the only way that people can trust another person is if he tells them uh, that he's uh, the best at what he does. So good for you. Or another another <laughs> way you can trust someone is if they tell you, yes, I have been down this road before. I have learned these lessons uh, sometimes in a, a difficult way. I have multiple degrees from the school of hard knocks. Uh, so I, I think that I've, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm at this like anyone else. If you feel like, oh, I did that too. Like, don't worry. I, I have been there for all three of these mistakes, actually. Uh, and I've often told people that it's okay to make mistakes. It's just not okay to refuse to learn from them. There you that, go. That's that's the key. It, you you you. If you're going to try something mm -hmm. and you want to grow in a civic area, you are going to make mistakes. That's fine. That's expected. It's not okay though to refuse to learn from mistakes. That's when you become stubborn and proud. And ironically, you make more mistakes when you do that. Yeah. Um, well, two, well, two things then before we I, we get to the list of the top three errors that an apologist might make. Um, do you ever have? Did you ever have the experience in your career as an apologist, whether in defending human life or defending the Catholic faith, where there's something that you said quite a few times, and then you found out later that's not true at all? What I've been saying. I know that's not on this list, but have you ever had that happen? <laughs> yes, uh, and I'll co I'll cover a few of those things um, that that I, you know examples of that. Uh, when I'll, I'll go through different um, areas here, uh, especially repeating uh, quotations that were never actually said either by people for or against the Catholic faith. Uh -huh. That's what motivated me to write my best-selling book, What the Saints Never Said, actually one of the motivating uh, things there. It is, the, so, it is actually the best-selling book on things that saints didn't say. There is not a better selling book than that one in it that is, category. It is true. There is not a better selling one. There is not a worse selling one. It is, uh, <laughs> it reminds me of one time, Cy, I went to a high school graduation for a very small homeschool high school co-op. And for that graduation, there was only one person in the senior class. So wow. he was valedictorian, homecoming king and last student body president <laughs> and last in his class <laughs> and all he was first in his class and last in his class. so yeah that's um but that and there, there are other things um ways that i've approached issues or maybe i'll cite particular things i i think for a while i, I probably said at one point when i was a beginning in apologetics i said that you know in comparison to protestantism catholicism is really good. I mean, look what Sola Scriptura has done. It's created 33,000 different Protestant denominations. I think I had said that for several years before I decided to look into that statistic personally to see that it's actually not, that statistic is, is not true. Uh, it comes from a source that claims 
there are like 20 different Catholic churches. It, it miscounts the rights within the church as if they were completely separate from the Catholic church itself. So there might be one example that pops into my head. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, but the, the other question is, it, it strikes me reading into your list here, I thought, Trent thinks, and I want to see if I'm right in, in this, that the person doing the apologetics is as important as the answers, that you, 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 you that who you are is actually really important in doing apologetics for the Christian faith. Absolutely. Uh, people are not robots. Uh, they don't just take in data or data, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, they really interact with other people. And so that's why St. I mean, it's not just I who makes this point. I mean, St. Paul makes this very clearly in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, I could have all the knowledge of the world and be puffed up, but if I am without love, I am like a resounding gong. That people, they won't care if you have the right answers or the truth. They'll let it go in one ear and out the other because they don't consider you a reliable human being. They don't consider you someone who cares about the welfare of others, so they are going to treat what you say uh, as being suspect. And that, and that's why, actually, two out of the, the three things I want to talk about today, the big mistakes apologists make, really deals more with one's dispositions than your, than your knowledge. Uh, making apologetics all about knowledge, uh, while that is a necessary condition yeah. for being good at apologetics, it is not a sufficient one. And if it boils down to it, you can have a uh, disaster. All right, we'll start with number three in our list of top three errors of an apologist. Number three, you write lack of rigor. What does that mean? Well, lack of rigor would just be when you uh, read into particular issues and look at arguments for and against, but you don't go deep enough into the issue in comparison to what you claim to be speaking about. So if you are trying to say, oh, well, I'm going to prove God exists with the cosmological argument or a certain cosmological argument, let's say the Kalam cosmological argument, but you've only read very popular short treatments of it, or you haven't read anything at all. Right. Maybe you've only watched some William Lane Craig videos on the subject and have gotten your data from there and you haven't read or watched very rigorous critiques from the other side, uh, you can be in for a, a world of hurt in that you're not prepared, you're not rigorous enough. Now, not everybody should be expected to be an expert in everything. So I'm qualifying that a bit here, a lack of rigor in comparison to what you're claiming. Now, for some subjects, I might say, this is what I have heard about this particular subject. This is what I would say to others. If you're saying I'm sharing what uh, brief cursory knowledge I have on something, then that's that's fine. You could say, well, if other things come up, I'll go and look into that. But overstating your knowledge, uh, or, or well, not necessarily overstating it, but overestimating your own knowledge in a certain area and then going out and doing apologetics, if you've only read the popular level treatment. So that's something that I've seen. I'll read or I'll watch other people. Uh, and sometimes I've read apologists. I've read full-fledged books on apologetics. And my favorite thing, Cy, in a book is to go to the footnotes. Uh, that's my favorite thing. I've actually declined to endorse books on apologetics because they didn't have footnotes. Um, now, that's fine. If it's like a memoir, that's fine. But if it's like supposed to be research and scholars, you're supposed to get into an argument, if you haven't done the research, I'm, I'm concerned you're not going to go deep enough into the argument. And others I've read where there are footnotes, it's only popular level works. So it's just other similar popular apologists, people who yeah. just read the, the, the introductory treatment to an issue, and they don't go into the deeper waters to really understand it, which sometimes that doesn't catch up to you. If you just do a, a generic video or a talk, um, usually you might be okay, though you might say something in a video that other people will rightly criticize as saying you don't actually know the fullness of this particular issue. Uh, if you get into a debate or a public dialogue with someone who is well-versed in the issue, then you might really be exposed to your your lack of knowledge on the particular issue. So that's my concern. And I think it's great for people to get involved in apologetics. They should. I don't want to scare people to think like, oh, I can't defend the faith if I don't know everything. No, you don't have to do that. But I'm just saying if you're kind of putting yourself out there as an apologist, especially, you do a blog, videos, be humble and be careful not to overextend 
your claims or your knowledge in certain areas. Um, that's what I would that's what I would focus on, especially in, in, in that point about lack of rigor. So for yourself, how do you overcome this? I mean, how do, is it just uh, a, a giving yourself time to study, making sure that you've uh, studied various issues? I, like, is I, I wonder if anyone's ever compiled a list of, here's the, the hundred things you should be proficient in if you're going to try Catholic apologetics or something. Well, I know I put out an ap ultimate apologetics reading list a few years ago oh, on the yeah. Catholic Answers online magazine. If you just search ultimate apologetics reading list, Trent Horn, I actually need to update that. Uh, it's, it's been a while since I um, put that uh, up there. It's several years. But I specifically put books there and I ranked the books based on beginning, intermediate and advanced in different subjects. So I think that you can understand an issue. You can read the beginning treatments. You understand it. Uh, then move on to the intermediate treatments, so it goes a little deeper. And then finally to the advanced treatments. Sometimes the advanced treatments only cover uh, one subsection. And when you do that, that's helpful because you avoid, and honestly, uh, one thing you can look at is when you make apologetic claims, be careful about making absolute claims. Uh, are you, you know, Should you be absolutely be careful? Yes. So this, this isn't <laughs> a universal, I'm not catching myself in relativism here. Some claims I can absolutely make. You know, I can absolutely make them. Other claims require uh, caveats or, or, or nuance. So there are some people who will say science proves the universe began to exist. That, uh, that would be overstating the evidence we have from physics, astrophysics, uh, from space-time geometry, cosmology. But you could say the evidence we have from these fields of science are consistent with the universe beginning to exist. Or... There are many things within these fields that point towards the universe having an absolute beginning in time. So notice here that you can protect yourself. That some people, when you only read the surface level, uh, well, I guess I will give you uh, an example. I've known some people who've tried to say the universe began to exist, and they'll cite a theorem published in 2003 called the bord vilenkin guth theorem. It is a theorem in, in cosmology and astrophysics, uh, and they'll cite this. And sometimes I've asked them, did, and they'll be very, very confident about this and not leave any room for, for, for nuance. And I'll say, well, did you actually read the four-page theorem on the Arvix website itself so that you know what you're saying here? This actually gets us to another point, Sai, and that would be in lack of rigor. Be careful. This is a mistake I've seen a lot. I've made it myself. Relying on secondary sources instead of primary sources. For example, like sharing a quotation from a church father or uh, other stories in history, you need to be careful uh, because sometimes there can be false statements or false quotations that will circulate in secondary sources. And each secondary source, you say, okay, where does this come from? And they'll quote another secondary source and they'll all quote each other. And then when you go back to the primary source, like the original writing of the church father, you'll see that Augustine, for example, never said, Rome has spoken, the case is closed. He said something very similar, but he didn't say that, that exact statement. Or the story of um, Luther nailing the, um, the theses on the church in Wittenberg may be apocryphal, yeah. may not have happened, or that he may not have been the one who said that justification is like how snow covers a dunghill. So I'll qualify. I'll say it has been attributed to or some say, instead of ah. saying Luther did this, Luther did, Luther did that, unless I am absolutely sure of the subject. All right. Uh, so uh, number two, uh, this one will blow your mind. After a lack of rigor, uh, we're moving up the list. These get more important as we go. The number two most important error that you believe that apologists make is what? Oh, Lack of charity. Oh, yeah. I forgot I was so supposed to say it. Sorry. Lack of charity. <laughs> lack of charity. Yeah. <laughs> So we're on the countdown. And I'm also, <laughs> I'm ranking these in ascending order of importance. So I would rather have an apologist who is ignorant of things, but is charitable than an uncharitable, highly intelligent apologist. I've also, I've thought about this, ah, I'm not exactly sure what I should do with this. Uh, but I think that that makes sense to me because the damage caused by ignorance, I think, is easier to fix. You can say, oh, well, here's actually the correct answer. Oh, OK. It's not 33,000 denominations. It's a lot, more than one, too many Protestant denominations or whatever. Oh, OK. 
but the damage that can be caused by an obnoxious individual who makes the church look bad with their behavior, that pe- that affixes to people in a more emotional way. I think it's more difficult to undo that, either to undo the damage or for the person to get a to get a fair hearing. Um, also, lack of charity is problematic because it goes back to number three. You actually end up being less rigorous when you are extremely unchar because you could be uncharitable in attitude, like oh you're 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 just a you're you're a <laughs> I heard an argument the other day online some uh, someone called the other person a ding dong. <laughs> uh, to me, that's just a funny insult. It makes me think of a doorbell ditching or a hostess snack cake. But um, which, by the way, are extremely good if you put it in the fridge. I don't know. I've I've been off sugar for about two weeks and I'm all jittery. Now you're dreaming thinking, about it. <laughs> no, I dream. I do dream about food, actually. Uh, you know, you, you you could be uncharitable in that way. But in my experience as an apologist, many other uncharitable things is uh, people will summarize arguments from their opponents and oh, state them yeah, in a right. very they'll state it in a very uncharitable way. Um, they'll look at an argument and, and oh, this is also called straw manning in logic. Uh, it's a logical fallacy when you refute a weaker version of an opponent's argument instead of the strongest version. So the most charitable apologists, what they will do is they will not straw man another person. They will steel man them. They will make their argument even stronger and then say, here is what's wrong with that. Uh, so you have to be careful that in your lack of charity, if, if you just assume things, you say, oh, Protestants think that uh, everything Jesus did is in the Bible, uh, when clearly the Bible says there are many things Jesus did not do that are not recorded there. But if you actually talk to any informed Protestant, they'll tell you, no, we don't believe everything Jesus did is in the Bible. We just believe everything that Jesus wanted us to know about salvation or our faith is in the Bible. So, and there's other times this can happen. I'll give you another example. Uh, sometimes when Catholics critique other holy books, they'll say, you know, oh, look at, uh, or other religions. They'll say, look at all the contradictions in the Quran or the Book of Mormon. I might say, well, hey, those sound kind of similar to the allegations atheists make against the Bible. Uh, and if we can offer plausible explanations for those kinds of contradictions, you have to let other people have those same plausible explanations. Now, I do think the difficulties in other holy books, uh, they are actually intractable when it comes to showing that they are divinely inspired, unlike the Bible. But you're not treating it the same. Or one last example I might give might be this. Some Catholics will, you know, you'll ridicule other beliefs and not understand them. Like people will say, who would ever be a Mormon? Mormons, you know, they, they're superstitious. They have to wear magic underwear to get to heaven or something like that. And that is both uncharitable and not rigorous because Mormons don't believe that the undergarments that they receive from their, uh, I believe it's from the endowment ceremony, the undergarments they receive, they're not a magic talisman to get them to heaven. Rather, they have a spiritual value to remind them of the importance of living their Mormon, of living out the Mormon faith. In that respect, if you're going to call that magic underwear, then you'll have to call a scapular a magic necklace. Yeah, right. If you're, if you're going to be that um, if you're going to hold that view. So the key is to not do that, is to understand, well, here's something that Protestants get right, Mormons get right, Muslims get right. I can see where they're going with this argument. However, here are the difficulties that I have with it or with an extension of that argument. And so that comes down to then in doing good apologetics is not just understanding the Catholic faith, but making sure you understand the faith of other people that you or the lack of faith of other people. There's different kinds of atheism, for example. And in doing that, you'll have a better chance of engaging people. Uh, I remember once, actually, I made a lot of headway discussing Mormonism with someone with a group of friends uh, because I kind of could speak to him inside baseball using Mormon terminology, like asking what ward or stake he belongs to, because they don't, that's not, they don't use the terminology church or parish uh, or even church, you know, church like Protestants might. Little things like that to show, oh, you've taken the time to learn what I believe, so I'll take the time to listen to you. Uh, all right. Lack of uh, rigor was number three. Lack of charity was number one. I mean, excuse me, number two. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really good at my numbers, I guess. Number one, the number one problem, uh, the number one error that you see apologists make, lack of spirituality. Ah, this is a dangerous one, my friend. Some people tell me, how, how do I become an apologist? Sometimes I want to tell them the answer is don't. 
don't become an apologist. Um, see, I mean, the Bible uh, in First Timothy talks about how, well, James talks about how teachers will be held to a, it's either First Timothy or, or James, either one, uh, says that uh, teachers and bishops, that they're going to be held to a higher standard because of, of their office and what they know. So I think that applies to apologists, especially those who publicly defend the faith and engage others. C.S. Lewis right. has a wonderful prayer called the Apologist Prayer. Uh, he talks about making quips where the audience uh, laughs and angels weep, uh, that you start to feel like, as an apologist, you confuse doing apologetics with having a healthy spiritual life. And so you think that, oh, well, as long as I'm doing apologetics, I'm living my Catholic faith. And so that substitutes you. You study the Bible instead of read the Bible. Uh, uh -huh. You study the saints instead of learning from the saints. Uh, you go to Mass out of obligation so you can get back home to study rather than uh, entering into the mystery of the liturgy. It's very dangerous, Sai, because some of the most uh, vociferous individuals that I engage in, the counter-apologists from other religions or from those who are atheists, they were former Catholic apologists. They did apologetics. Wow. They did all these things. Right. And then they left and they said, oh, I know all that stuff. And then they're, they're off the reservation. And so it, and it's so difficult to see people who are once so strong to fall away. And I think in a lot of cases, what happens is that, yeah, they, they lose sight of the spiritual connection. And that's not first. And that's something I've been guilty of. I, I'm, I'm guilty of it uh, as, yeah, as yeah. well. It's something I'm always trying to compensate for. Because if you, if you lose sight of it, you can quickly uh, turn the arguments against yourself and cut yourself off from the source of life. And you definitely will not be charitable because we just don't have that charity. That, right. that charity doesn't come from us. It will be difficult for you to, especially you won't have, if you're in mortal sin especially, you won't have the supernatural virtue of charity. You could do things that are pleasing to others, right. but you won't be pleasing God. And in many cases, I think, yeah, you'll even lack the natural virtue of, of charity and having that disposition. So I guess if you notice these three elements, they kind of build on themselves. Uh, if, you're, if you're not charitable, if, you know, you don't, you're not rigorous, you won't be effective. If you're not charitable, it'll, you'll lose rigor oftentimes. And if you lack a spirit, healthy spirituality, uh, you will lack charity in your response to others. You'll, and I've seen this. I've seen this among apologists who get very nasty uh, with others in debates or online and social media. Not that I'm immune to that. Everybody has a bad day. But they, they, have a, they tend to cultivate a reputation as if this is a, a virtue rather than a vice. So I would say to be a good apologist, you must start by having a, a, a healthy spirituality, a prayer life, the sacraments, availing yourself of the sacrament of confession, and understanding that's where pride comes in, thinking that you're the greatest, you're the one no. keeping the faith going. Look, right. in a hundred years, uh, nobody's probably going to even, you know, maybe probably know a Trent Horn book. You know, the faith is going to go, it goes on its own without me. I'm just helping where God wants me to help. But if you start thinking the faith depends on you instead of you depend on the faith, that's where you're going to be in a world of hurt. You don't think things the saints never said is going to be around in a hundred years? Like, my concern would people, be would they make that a, it almost like a kind of quasi scripture that people would be over appreciative of it. No, no maybe people will just argue uh, disputed quotation. If you think the faith <laughs> depends on you rather than you <laughs> depend on the faith. Did Trent Horn say this? Maybe, but it probably was Mother Teresa, actually. <laughs> Mother <laughs> That's Teresa said all the good about. stuff. Well, it's Mother Teresa. Uh, Trent, thank you very, very much. I'll, I'll just repeat for folks, lack of rigor, lack of charity, and lack of a spiritual life or lack of spirituality are the top three errors. It's not an error like, um, uh, you know, like you, you thought this, but the answer was that. All those things can be dealt with. Um, rigor will help. But I mean, even, I mean, I see the very best apologists in the world in my job, and sometimes they make a mistake. Sometimes they, sure. they, only they don't know the answer. As a matter of fact, I wonder, and I'll leave this as the, as the last question for you. Do you. Have you gotten more comfortable with being able to say, I don't know, as you've done this over the years? Yes, absolutely. Though my preferred phrase in those situations is usually, I'm going to have to look into that. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it makes it easier than having to say, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Or you might say, there's a lot of facets to that issue that I'd like to look into before I give you a comprehensive answer. Because in many cases, I do have a rough answer to the question. There's the difference there. It's not so much a blank, unless it's like some subject I've absolutely never heard of before. 
Uh, there was, you know, and someone brought up the Urantians once to me. I'm like, what? And then I go and look up, look it up. But usually it's, I'm familiar with that. But as you get more experience, you see, I'm going to be cognizant of my limits on that particular topic and to answer any particular question on it. Uh, I might have to go deeper if it's a subset question that I'm not as, I'm not as familiar with. But I am more comfortable with that. I, I remember once, I remember, Sai, at the very beginning, uh, as an apologist to the Catholic Answers Conference, we'd have that panel. And it's kind of like, you know, you get the question and how are you going to answer? And I was super duper nervous when Carl would ask me a question because it's like, oh, man, I'm the new kid. And if I can't prove I know what I've got, they're going to fire me. Yeah. Uh, and I was all nervous and I got to know everything. But now I've been with you guys for 10 years. I can just say, hey, you know, I'm not really sure. Jimmy, what do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just because, you know, there's things that I, I focus on, things I don't. And that's OK. Right. Very good. Uh, Trent Horn, thanks for doing this with us. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to TrentHornPodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.